right. All right, so uh, yeah, just a little bit more about me. Um, I actually graduated from Berkeley, and uh, Stanford hired me nevertheless, so <laughs> I'm glad you all know about that rivalry. Um, I just wanted to point out, I, you know, I, I teach a bunch of classes, but maybe one that's maybe generally of interest to you is in the winter. Uh, Energy 293B, it's also uh, cross-listed as electrical engineering 293B, and it's a, essentially about renewable heat, um, so renewable processes but involving heat. So uh, I thought I'd also tell you a little bit about energy resources uh, engineering. So we um, offer a you know, full suite of degrees, okay, and our department, uh, in a way our, our technical mission is to sort of position uh, students, our graduates, to be uh, ready to respond to the sort of changing energy landscape. And that's also reflected in what our department uh, does for uh, research as well. And you can see these, uh, these things here. So Adam Brandt, uh, who you heard from this morning, is, is, one of, uh, is one of my colleagues in the department. OK, so uh, I was tasked with talking about oil, so I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about uh, innovations uh, because the, actually the oil and gas industry is uh, an amazingly innovative uh, industry, uh, really slow for uptake on innovations like things that are implemented. Uh, it's also one of the largest uh, consumers of computing, actually it is the largest consumer of computing power, um, and I'll explain that. Um, so this is a picture from the Coalinga oil field here in California. And um, so I'll just talk a little bit about uh, innovations. And um, I won't get everything you know, that's, that's been important. But I'll, I'll talk about resources, and then I'll talk about technology. So uh, in terms of resources, uh, there's been, in addition to what people just kind of think about, there's been uh, at least really two significant directions. One is to go after uh, offshore oil. Um, so this is actually, uh, this is Mississippi Canyon 252. So if you know, this is actually the Macondo well that blew out in the Gulf of Mexico. So there was about 5,000 feet of water and then um, it continued on for about another 13,000 feet below the surface of the ocean to a depth of 18,000 feet. Um, so, that, you know, if you think about that, that you have to, you know, locate something in the ocean and then drill something down uh, and then keep it safe, uh, it's a pretty, amazing, uh, a pretty amazing amount of technology. And, you know, unfortunately, they didn't get it quite right. Um, you know, but hopefully we've learned from that. And there's, so offshore development is not just Gulf of Mexico. It's also um, offshore Africa is a really hot place at the moment as well as uh, offshore Australia. Um, and the other uh, kind of really big uh, thing has been sort of tight resources. So you've all heard about shale. Um, a lot of things that people refer to shale is not actually shale. Um, it's a, sort of a, a generic term. And there's actually a geological definition that all things don't necessarily fit. So you could say sort of tight resources. And um, I couldn't fit all of the U.S. in, but this at least captures, you know, a lot of the, the really major uh, areas around the U.S. So geographically very large uh, areas, very thick um, resources. So going after those uh, sort of in a way, um, again, non-traditional resources has been a really big part of uh, innovation. And then in terms of technology, I. I for me, these are sort of the four big things. Other people would have a different list. So on the upper left is actually a picture from a microfluidic device. Um, so these are, the, these are actually the grains of a porous medium, and everything else is flow space. So this is oil and water, and there's some funny chemistry going on in here. But actually being able to uh, visualize what oil looks like in the pore space, and this is a one-to-one -one this is an actual, you see the scale bar, 100 microns, so you're actually really looking at the right sort of scale. Uh, this has been a really transformational um, development because people can develop better conceptual models. You can then, from your better conceptual model, can develop a better numerical model. And there's a whole field of study 
that talks about scale translation. So how do you go from you know, something that's this scale where the fluids are really flowing to that sort of gigantic scale that we looked at on the, the previous uh, slide, right? Sort of the, 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 the geographic scale. Um, so a big part, I mentioned computing power. So uh, a, a big transformational thing that's occurred uh, starting from about the 1960s in the oil industry is the ability to build geological models and then actually simulate flow in them. So like a, a, a geologist might build a really uh, nice picture of what the subsurface might look like. So you see here this structure, the different colors are different sort of geographical, uh, sorry, geological um, layers. A reservoir engineer would come and take a small piece of that uh, and then might conduct a flow simulation. So this is oil on top and water that's coning up underneath. So the ability to actually simulate things has been a really, you know, and, and to do sort of a full suite of sort of probabilistic um, study has been a really transformational part of the, part of the industry. Another, another thing uh, has been, uh, a, a so GP is geophysics, so geophysical imaging. So the earth is opaque, right? Um, you know, we have lots of wells poked in all parts of the earth. And so in a well, you can look at something just opposite the well bore or maybe, you know, a little bit out. But there are geophysical techniques. You can actually see structure in the earth and layers. Part of what might have gone to make this picture would be some geophysical imaging. But a combination of geophysical imaging and being able to actually drill in and steer in and this is showing you a, you know, a well that's come down. This is actually a deviated well because it's following whatever this, you know, this cartoon layer is. That's been a very sort of important thing as well. So <clears throat> being able to reach out from an area on the surface and then drill out a very long distance and reach some, you know, what they refer to as a pay zone has been a really important uh, thing as well. And then uh, really the technology that everybody uh, sort of, loves to talk about, uh, hydraulic fracturing. So this is showing you a long horizontal well. Again, you can imagine that this got into some layer that was quite interesting. And then, uh, you know, fractures have been induced. And if you drill, uh, you know, depends on which direct, this is typically the direction that they drill in. So you get fractures that are normal to the, to the well bore, but you could also have fractures that are along the, along the well bore. So here's the quick uh, question. Um, what decade do you think hydraulic fracturing was, uh, was developed in? Uh, basically the 1950s, 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000. Anybody got a? 50s. 50s, yeah. So basically the first hydraulic, well, the first one that was done intentionally was about 1947. Um, so really 1950s, they started to apply it. Um, probably it was done unintentionally um, and the first time that people started to inject water. Uh, so it's actually a really old technology, but this combination of hydraulic fracturing and, uh, and horizontal wells has been sort of important as well. So um, you could ask the question, um, you know, has this made a difference in everything? You know, have these innovations really mattered? So we're looking at U.S. Uh, crude oil production. Uh, so has anyone not heard of sort of like the Hubbard, you know, peak oil kind of, you've not heard of it? Okay, so uh, in, so I'll tell you the story real quickly and I'll watch the time. So uh, this geologist, well actually he was a physicist, he's referred to as a geologist, uh, M. King Hubbard in the 1960s was tasked with uh, predicting future oil production in the U.S. So he worked for Shell Oil. So Shell was trying to figure out what to do. So he basically applied a model, and his idea was sort of a bell-shaped curve, so something like this that goes up and down. Um, and so he applied a model, uh, a logistic model, but you can think of it as basically a bell-shaped curve. Uh, so in fact, on this plot, uh, the gray line is, uh, is my prediction using Hubbard's data. He was a little more conservative than me. Um, but so in 1964, 62, uh, if I remember the dates quite correctly, uh, Hubbard predicted that oil production in the US would peak in the mid 1970s and uh, the green is actual data and so in fact it, it did peak in the, the mid 1970s. 
Um, and so you can see that, so again, here's gray is his prediction. Uh, green is actually what's occurred. And there's some, so, you know, some of these resources are part of the reason why, you know, things deviated uh, sort of in the sort of the mid 1990s. Um, so the blue lines, just to give you reference, are 1998, because this is when Mitchell Energy, actually they were going after gas in the Barnett Shale, but they're really the first, one, the first company that really said we're gonna do uh, hydraulic fractures and horizontal wells and we're gonna make it sort of work. So if you want, that's sort of the modern, you know, beginning of the modern fracture age. So you can see, um, you can see there's this huge you know, deviation. Uh, US oil production's gone up. But what's really interesting is this plot on the right. So in Hubbard's technique, um, and I'll, I spared you all the math, you plot the production rate, which is DNDT, over the cumulative production, so the total amount that's come out, versus the cumulative production. And if you get a straight line, that means you're obeying his model, right? So your system is following logistic growth, and you can you know, just think of that as like a, you know, a bell-shaped curve. So you can see from about you know, 2000 or so, uh, we're not following logistic behavior anymore. So people will talk about paradigm shifts, right? And they'll give you all kinds of examples about paradigm shifts and how you can know them or not. But uh, this, this is a paradigm shift um, that we're not following logistic growth. There are very few natural resource plays that don't follow uh, logistic growth in some way. So, you know, this, this may, with, you know, current sort of economics, this may turn around and kind of come down and, and, and go back, right? Um, but at the moment, it's a, it's a really significant deviation. The other thing that kind of Hubbard's technique gives you, if you just sort of take and plot a straight line, uh, it kind of gives you ultimately what you might expect to produce. So you can see if we're actually going up, that means the, the, the ultimate sort of recovery, recoverable amount might, uh, is projected to increase. So it's pretty, it's pretty uh, interesting, right, that we can point to these innovations and actually see a, you know, see a signal and actually see a, see a paradigm shift. Any questions on that? Again, cut through, didn't you know, give you five slides of equations to, to work through, but that's basically how it works. And that's, that's what I find fascinating is that we're, uh, we're, we're experiencing a, a much different kind of behavior. And natural gas has a similar kind of a thing. So I want to tell you a little bit about the future. Um, and uh, here's Yogi Berra. Uh, you know, known now for really kind of folksy sayings, like, you know, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. I think he said something, too, about, you know, nobody ever goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Um, but those are his 10 World Series rings that he won while he was a player. Um, he won another three as a coach um, that aren't shown there. So pretty awesome, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, baseball player um, as we're heading into sort of the, the, the end run here. Uh, but this is always, you know, so I'll, I'll say a couple things about the future and keep that in mind, okay? So we need a little audience participation, okay? Um, so you need to think out to 2040, okay? Uh, think about sort of the current energy landscape, okay? There's lots of renewable energy going on, um, going online at the moment. Actually, wind is following nice, beautiful logistic growth. Uh, it makes a great test problem. You can actually try and figure out how much wind you think the US might build, uh, and it's a huge amount. So uh, just as a point of reference, uh, right now, globally, uh, if you think about you know, just market share, fossil fuels are about 81, 82% market share for, for, uh, for, uh, for the total energy mix. So here are our choices, 12%, 38, 37, 78, right? So uh, why don't we do a quick show of hands? How many people think it's A? Uh, how many people think it's B? B, okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, let's say 15, okay. Uh, how many people say it's C? Ooh, so a lot more, so about We'll say that's about 35. Okay, how many people say it's D? Okay, so this, so, uh, so 
Uh, this is actually interesting and somewhat uh, uh, a challenge. So the best sort of estimates, even considering in you know renewable growth, everything, uh, is that we're you know sort of 2040, we're going to still be you know roughly three quarters of our primary energy is going to be um, fossil fuels. Okay, and uh, you know. Battery electric vehicles are great. Battery kind of things are great. Uh, predictions are that the primary energy source isn't going to transform as much. Um, you know, there's still a lot of the primary energy source is going to be fossil fuels. Batteries, you know, how they're deployed will give us a way of being more efficient, um, but uh, as well as you know, can store renewable energy. But really, the underlying source is predicted to still be fossil fuels. So it is. It's a huge challenge. Um, so I was going to talk about innovations in the oil and gas industry. So you could, there's a lot of things um, to, to, to consider, um, one of which is actually demand growth. So part of that is you know, India is expected to have 100% uh, increase in oil demand by 2040. China, about a 50% increase in oil demand um, by 2040. Okay, so you can see the other things. What I'm going to talk about is really sort of greenhouse gas emissions, pick up on some of the themes you heard from uh, Kate a little bit. But why do I say this? Because I think, you know, the, you, you know, the numbers really, sp so let's say that number is off. Let's say it's 78%, say it's 60%, right, market share. That's still a lot of carbon that needs to be uh, dealt with. And I think, you know, the oil and gas industry, um, you know, is, is going to try to rise to the challenge of, of helping to manage carbon. So there's a lot of things uh, that could be, you know, done around greenhouse gas emissions. I'll talk about oil production uh, for a little bit. I'm going to watch time. So I'll give you an example, because uh, I think this is kind of a fun example, and it illustrates a little bit of sort of maybe like nonlinear thinking that we need. So this is a schematic of actually how oil is produced in the Kern River oil field here in California. Kern River is one of the oldest, oldest uh, producing fields in the US. Uh, it still has two thirds of its original oil inside of it, uh, even though it's been producing for over a century. Um, so it's a, it's a, people talk about big oil fields, so it's a, an elephant. It's a huge, huge field. So oil is currently produced there in the following way. Um, there is a so-called cogeneration plant. So there's an important thing missing here, which is natural gas. So this cogeneration plant burns natural gas. The primary thing that it does is it generates electricity, which gets sold out into the grid. A small amount gets actually used in the oil field. But it gets sold out into the grid. And instead of just venting all of the waste heat out of the, out of the smokestacks of the, of the natural gas fire plant, they capture that heat and they make steam. Okay, so that steam gets injected into the oil field um, because heat has a really profound effect on the viscosity of oil and it makes oil more producible. And uh, so that enhances the production of oil and uh, also means that there's a fair amount of water that's produced. This water actually gets cycled back and gets reused. Kern River is also interesting because the water is actually fresh enough that if they clean it up, uh, you can't drink it, but it is suitable for agriculture. So they actually sell some of their water that they produce for, um, for agriculture. So again, if you think about you know, those carbon emissions that uh, Kate talked about, um, you know, this, 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 you know, this facility, even just discounting the oil that it produces, but this part of it makes a fair amount of uh, CO2. And uh, it's kind of quantified here on this uh, slide. So the green is, oh, so first of all, this is in this really bizarre units of grams of CO2 per megajoule of gasoline um, before anything is blended into it. So it's pure just gasoline before anybody adds any ethanol or oxygenates or anything like that because the amount of ethanol gets, gets added, gets changed by the season and all these kinds of things. So, so just in terms of a, if you want just like a, a quantum, right, the green bar is the amount of CO2 produced just by combusting gasoline, 
Okay, so in all of these scenarios, it's the same. Okay, so the bottom is sort of a conventional crude oil. Okay, so it's about 90 grams of CO2 per megajoule. Okay, so if we look at this line that's California thermal, the red is the CO2, equivalent CO2 emissions that are generated by, you know, burning natural gas to make steam. Okay, so uh, people have pointed out um, correctly that, uh, that all of that CO2 doesn't belong to the oil field. Some of that CO2 belongs to the electricity, and natural gas electricity is actually a lot less CO2 intensive than sort of regular grid electricity. So they can actually take a little bit of an emissions credit, which is why this is box is a little bit red. But what's interesting, if you think about California, uh, we have pretty good sunshine. Um, maybe they don't need to actually uh, you know, burn as much natural gas to make heat, okay? So uh, this so-called California solar thermal, the red is gone because all of the heat is generated by solar energy. And now you have something that's basically equivalent to, you know, to conventional crude, and that's about a 25% reduction in CO2 emissions, okay? So it doesn't get rid of all of the issue of you know, of the green, which is going to come from the burning of the gas, but, you know, maybe we can be really efficient when we do that. Uh, but it is a 24% sort of reduction if you can realize that. So I'll just show you, you know, one basically piece of technology that's being worked on. So this is uh, a company that's over in the East Bay, and their sort of shtick, if you will, is they can make mirrors that you see inside of this glass house super inexpensively and they can get the optics really good. So this is a concentrating solar thermal process. So the mirror reflects light back up onto this receiver tube here, okay? And then uh, you, can, you, know, you can boil water and, and use that for uh, steam. So if you, make a, if you make a mirror that's really cheap, uh, it's really light, so if you put it out in the environment, it's going to blow around, and it's also going to get pitted by dust. So they actually put this inside of a, of a, of a so-called glass house, okay? So it's basically a repurposed greenhouse. And the other kind of interesting thing is, you know, you need to keep the thing clean, so when you have a structure like a glass house, it can just sort of be washed automatically. So they have a nice, uh, they have a nice uh, kind of a, uh, a process. And they're, in fact, they're building one of these. They've, they've built one of these in California. They've built one in the Middle East. They're currently building a second one in the Middle East. That's a gigawatt of heat, um, right? So 1,000 megawatts, OK? Um, and, uh, and the reason for that is natural gas, if you want to buy it in the Middle East, is really expensive. Um, so there's a couple of questions you know, that, that are kind of interesting to think about. Um, you know, the sun is doesn't shine all the time, right? Uh, and I want to be able to inject that into the, you know, into the earth and recover oil. Does the earth care if I inject, uh, you know, I inject steam for eight hours a day and then really reduce it and then inject steam for, the earth doesn't care and that's basically a simulation that's showing you this. So these are actually vertical wells and this is the heat front and that's 240 C. The earth doesn't, you know, as I said, the earth really doesn't care if you put in steam continuously or if you put it in in cycles. This is also pretty interesting if you think about you want to store heat, um, you know, and you can use it later for the same kind of, the same sort of issue. Um, so I'll, t I'll just tell you, uh, so, the, you know, the, you know the, so you can ask some questions, right? Does this make sense economically? Um, does this make sense in an engineering way? And, 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 and you know, that slide, previous slide sort of showed you um, some of the questions that we've asked about that. But we can do a really interesting thing with Kern River. So Kern River is an old oil field. They've been injecting steam in Kern River since even prior to 1980. Um, so you can go back, you can get the historical data. So you know exactly how much steam they injected. You know exactly how much oil was produced. You can ask questions about why did they inject this much steam and get this much oil, and they injected half as much steam and still got the same oil. But you know, that's another, maybe that's another story. Um, but we know everything. So we know what water cost, we know what oil sold for, we know how much electricity costs, we know how much natural gas cost. So you can actually do uh, basically an economic analysis with no uncertainty about the cost on oil, right? 
because that's always the biggest thing. You could, you know, there's one prediction that you can make about the, the price of oil is that the predictions that we make are gonna be wrong. Um, so we don't have to do that, no predictions, okay? So again, I'll skip a whole bunch of stuff and I'll just show you sort of the bottom line. So these are a bunch of different scenarios. These are different um, discount rates, okay? So 5% uh, discount rate and up to 15% discount rate. So this one is basically if you just burn natural gas and you make steam, this is if you make all of your steam by doing that cogeneration that I showed you. This is the actual mix uh, that they use between direct steam and cogeneration. This is a 100% solar case, okay? So at a 5% discount rate, which is not unreasonable giving, given what inflation's been and, and things, the, the solar case makes $23 billion before taxes are figured in. Okay, so taxes are really get confusing because you might take a tax credit on installing a solar facility, you might not. So no taxes, this is just plain profit before people think about taxes. So the actual most profitable thing is to, uh, is to, build, a, uh, is to, is to build a solar plant from day one. The other interesting thing too is you could say, well, I don't know, maybe I'm not that bullish on solar and you know, my engineers don't want to turn down steam. I could tell you a whole story about why engineers don't want to turn down steam at night. Um, I don't want to do that. I just want to run my plant just like I've run it. And if you give me solar steam, I'll take solar steam. Um, so this quarter, 25% solar is about what you could do. It just annually, you could make, you know, if you said, here's 100% of my steam demand, I'm not gonna ever reduce rate, you could deliver about 25% of, uh, you know, of your steam just by solar. And that still makes $21 billion, and that's still more than any of these processes involving natural gas, okay? The, the discount rates illustrate, you know, an, an unfortunate thing about renewable energy is that they're very capital intensive, right? The fuel is free. You can't, we haven't figured out how to tax the sun yet. Um, maybe somebody will. Um, but anyways, if you really wanna penalize a renewable process, you just, you just subject it to a high discount rate. But even at 10%, these solar cases are kind of hanging in there, okay? So it's, it's, it's something to think about, right? And there's no, again, there's no subsidy at all. This is all just, let's just build a solar plant from day one, okay? Um, so I'll just, I'll just, I have some other stuff, but I'll just maybe quickly summarize it, right? So um, that doesn't take care, you know, that is the first part I told you about is really about reducing, you know, being more efficient, being smarter. Um, you know, if we're really going to have something like three quarters of our primary energy provided by, um, you know, fossil fuels, we have to think of some way to really deal with that carbon. So, you know, Kate told you a little bit about um, sequestration. Um, there's a lot of really interesting, you know, science questions about, you know, what is going to happen with CO2 in the subsurface. Um, or, you know, what can we do on the surface to, to capture carbon in some sort of like a, a solid form. But maybe I'll, I'll hold off for another day. There's some really interesting stuff about how we don't really know how to predict very well. That's some micro particle image velocimetry to tell us a little bit better about the constituent relations. And I just want to get to my last slide. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say about, you know, innovation really is essential in uh, the oil and gas industry. And there have been some really, you know, big innovations. Um, and, you know, the hurdles to come are still really uh, significant. And, uh, you know, I think that's actually a good thing. Challenges are good because it gets people to actually think out of the box. And again, as I said, sort of think non-linearly. And I think I held for a couple minutes of questions. So I'll see if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, so his question is, have there been studies about the, you know, the, about the actual production over time? Well, I mean, I showed, so in, in aggregate, yes, I showed you one, right, the Hubbard. That is production rate. Production rate, yeah. I'm talking about uh, uh, quantity, volume. Well, that is, that is volume, yeah. So we're, generally, we do better with predictions over longer term, right, than we do over, like, you know, next year. Um, and the re reason that is like the local economics or, or the small scale economics are really 
hard to predict. Um, so like, you know, oil, for, you know, most people think, oh great, you know, gas, price of gasoline went down to the pump. That's a good thing. Um, it's not a good thing for the environment. It's really not a good thing for like long-term planning on around energy processes either. So yeah, so like the long-term predictions like, like volumes versus time um, are, are generally okay. Um, but sort of the short-term ones are really hard to, to kind of get right because of just the, the variability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how do I see peak oil playing out on an international scale? Um, you know, you if we if we looked at like global data, you can make an argument that maybe we were at peak oil ten years ago, five years ago. Um, because that's what sort of was driving some of these unconventional resources that really sort of played in. Um, so the, I guess maybe the, the thing that we should, should, so people argue about what's the oil endowment of the world, right? So some people say it's 13 trillion barrels, some say it's 15. Let's just say it's 10, because it's an even sort of a number. So we've burned about a trillion barrels of oil, okay? The reserves are about another trillion, okay? And what people are arguing about is, you know, can we, you know, sort of secure the third trillion? Um, so there's, there's tons of hydrocarbon out there. Um, it's really, you know, the peak oil argument is really a, a, a technology economics argument. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's got the zero time, so I'll stop there. But, but we're not running out of resource. We're, it's just, you know, are there better options if you don't even think environmentally, if you just think economically? Um, because those are really low quality resources out there at 10, you know, the 10th trillion would be a really low quality resource. Okay, that's it.